My name is Susan Engel, and I teach psychology at Williams College, where I also direct the program in teaching. A few years ago, I was observing in a fourth grade classroom, and the teacher had set out all these wonderful materials for the kids to learn about how wheels were invented and how the Egyptians discovered how to transport materials in order to build pyramids. And she had given them these little dowels and these little sort of wood blocks and these strings with something called a newton on it, which allowed the kids to realize that if they put the block on a, on a roller, on a wheel, it would move faster than if they just dragged it along the ground. And she also gave them a worksheet. And the idea was for them to experiment with these materials until they discovered what the Egyptians had discovered, that the wheels made things work faster. And she was walking around, encouraging the kids and reminding them to answer the questions on the worksheet and to keep moving. And then she wandered by a group of kids who had sort of lost track of the, her idea of the goal of the activity and were experimenting in all kinds of ways with the equipment and, and trying things that weren't on the worksheet. And the teacher said, now, now, kids, I'll give you time to experiment at recess. This is time for science. Well. There's a problem in that story, which is that teacher and many teachers all over the country get it wrong when they're more focused on finishing the worksheet than they are in helping children learn how to experiment. After all, experimenting is not what should happen in recess. It's what should happen during the school day. This is related to the research I've been doing for the last 12 years, which is on children's curiosity. What we've learned from research is that kids start life with this voracious appetite uh, for knowledge. You can't stop a two-year-old from trying to find out everything they can about everything they encounter. The more surprised they encounter, things are not what they expect, the more eager they are to solve the puzzle, to figure out why something was unexpected. So children are born with this enormous capacity to learn. And the question is, what happens over time? Why is it that by the time they get to middle school, so many children seem so incurious? Now, when kids are little, research has shown, they ask almost 200 questions in every two-hour stretch of time. Uh, they, they can't stop uh, trying to find out about what's around them. When we follow those same children to school, we find that they ask fewer than 10 questions in any given two-hour period of time. So again, this is evidence that we're not doing what we could be doing to encourage the kind of investigation and exploration that really lies at the heart of the educational process. One of the things that happens is that teachers inadvertently discourage children from exploring and asking questions. And they do it in ways they don't even mean to. They frown when a kid opens something up. They tell a child there isn't time for questions because they have to learn the material. And in fact, what we need to do is figure out how to make a classroom a place where um, a child not only get, feels free to investigate, but gets better at it. Because school is not just a place to allow children to be their natural selves. That's silly. Uh, human beings cultivate one another. They guide, they instruct. Uh, little children want to be more like grown-ups. So what we need to do is figure out how to make a classroom a place where a child gets to at, learns how to ask better questions, learns how to figure out what kinds of information would answer their question, and learns how to decide when a question has been answered, when they need to ask a new question. When classrooms can cultivate that kind of curiosity, they begin to do the real job of educating, because the curious person is the educated person. Mm -hmm.